Nevada's legislative session is over, while a special session could soon come to a close. A look at what bills have passed and what was left behind. That's this week on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. The biggest takeaways from this year's legislative session, we have a panel in studio to discuss that ahead. But first, to Carson City, where the legislature has passed a bill providing the Oakland A's up to $380 million in public funding for the construction of a new stadium on the Las Vegas Strip. Nevada Independent reporter Sean Galanka joins us now. And Sean, this bill originally died during the regular session, but Governor Joe Lombardo called a special session for it. Lawmakers scoffed when the A's brought back the very same bill that didn't make it out of the regular session and then proceeded to make their own changes to it. So let's go through those changes. Which were the most important in your opinion? Right, so I think kind of top of mind with lawmakers concerns over the same bill being brought was the community benefits agreement. Uh, we saw a similar thing with the Allegiant Stadium deal and, and the Raiders coming in where the team basically has to sign a community benefits agreement agreeing to make certain investments in the community. So the latest changes to the athletics bill were really all about putting some stricter requirements into that, some more teeth into it for, for oversight and making sure they're complying with those requirements. Could you give us some examples of what those requirements are? Right. So one thing is diversity in workforce. So making sure that the construction workers, stadium workers represent a, a diverse group of people, uh, making sure that they're being paid a livable wage is a part of that as well. Also, certain cash investments. So whenever the, the Oakland A's or then the Las Vegas A's are, are in Southern Nevada, they'll have to make contributions of at least $2 million annually into the community, whether that's um, you know, donations to charities or even some kind of in-kind services, of, you know, putting on things in the community and that sort of thing. Now, in addition to those community benefits, putting some teeth into those requirements, as you had said, uh, this also resurrects two bills that Governor Lombardo had vetoed. What are those bills that are now part of this? Right. So those two bills uh, had been vetoed earlier by Lombardo. One of them basically makes sure that railroad and monorail projects comply with the state's prevailing wage laws. Um, so just kind of wage requirements on those types of projects. Uh, we could see transportation like a monorail going to and from the A stadium, even something like the Las Vegas uh, Boring Company Loop is technically a monorail. Um, and then the other bill requires companies seeking tax abatements from the state to provide paid family and medical leave. Um, I think it's a rate of 55% of their regular wage for 12 weeks. So the inclusion of these two bills, does it make Governor Lombardo's signature on this bill any less likely? I don't think so. I think that kind of stems from the negotiations between the governor's office and Democratic leadership in the legislature. You know, he called this special session He's expressed support for this A's deal. So clearly, you know, he wants the team in Southern Nevada. And so I think Democratic leaders kind of understanding that he wanted that were able to get some of their own concessions from him with these vetoed bills being brought back in. Remind our viewers why Governor Lombardo wants this so bad. I think it's, a, you know, it, it can be a jobs bill. It's an economic investment. Um, whenever his chief of staff, Ben Kikefer, presented the original bill during the regular session, now, about a couple of weeks ago, um, he said he think he thought it would be really an investment for the state, that ultimately it would bring more revenue into the state's general fund than if this investment were not made. And you also brought up negotiations that have been happening. How have they been happening? Because it hasn't quite been out in public. Right. It's all it's all behind the scenes. The legislative process uh, is not always the most transparent. But, you know, something that we've seen just being on the ground in the Capitol, uh, Senate Majority Leader Nicole Canzaro, Assembly Speaker Steve Yeager, we've seen them walking over uh, across the Capitol Yard to the governor's office. So they've been in there, you know, behind closed doors negotiating this this through. And that, you know, that goes back all the way to the regular legislative session through both of the special sessions we've now been through. 
this is the way of business in Nevada. Uh, did you get any sense that this decision was made in haste because lawmakers have expressed frustration having to stay past the regular session deadline? You know, I, I think that's a tough judgment to make. They certainly grilled the A's officials. I think they had lengthy meetings behind closed doors with folks like A's president Dave Cavill and team owner John Fisher, as well as the people who presented the bill, uh, economic analyst Jeremy Aguero and the head of the stadium authority, Steve Hill. You know, these these people were were in communication with lawmakers and they were sorting out these details of the community benefits agreement and of the amendments, you know, behind closed doors, but those conversations were were happening. All right, and as you have reported, there is a lot of work left for the A's to actually relocate to Las Vegas. What comes next for them? Well, first, they, they need approval from Major League Baseball owners to actually relocate from the city of Oakland, um, and that's really the key step from getting out of there and moving to Vegas. Uh, there's also the question of whether they'll have the relocation fee waive. That could be, um, I think, the estimate was maybe $250, $300 million, although MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred has indicated that could or would be waived for the A's relocating to Las Vegas. Um, there are certain, I think, fees they have to pay to get out of that, that lease at the Oakland Coliseum. They need to find a temporary home b b during the time of the construction of the stadium. There's been talk of them playing potentially even at the Las Vegas ballpark where the Aviators currently play. Um, so there's still a lot to figure out, and that's even, you know, putting aside the agreements that they have to reach with the stadium authority. They have to come up with $1.1 billion in, in private financing for this project, and that's from, you know, a team owner who's been reluctant to spend a lot on the team itself. So uh, we're waiting to see where that private capital comes from as well. All right. A lot of hurdles remain. Sean Galanka with the Nevada Independent. Thank you for your time. And here now to share their thoughts on the A's as well as the rest of Nevada's 2023 legislative session are Sandra Cosgrove, College of Southern Nevada History Professor and Executive Director of Vote Nevada, a nonprofit focused on nonpartisan civics education. Also, Michael Schaus, libertarian political columnist and founder of Schaus Creative, and Chris June Kiliani, former Democratic State Assemblywoman and Clark County Commissioner. Wow, you all have some long titles there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't pay well, no more. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what has been a long legislative session. Uh, you just heard from Sean Galanka of the Nevada Independent what's going on with the A's. I want to hear real quickly from each of you. Would you have voted for this bill as it currently stands? Sandra, I'll yes. start with you. Yes. You would. What about you, Chris? Absolutely not. No? And Michael? No. Okay, well, let's go with why yes first. Um, looking at the people who lined up behind it. And so you had a lot of the major casinos, um, you had the resort association, but then you had a lot of the building trades, you had culinary union. Um, when you've got that many people behind something, it's probably going to pass. And so it's, it, to me, let's get it passed and then make sure that the things that are in it get implemented. Okay, so you see both sides as uh, being represented as wanting this, both, uh, I guess, the community aspect as well as the business aspect. But what is she missing in either of your opinions? To me, it's about public policy, and it's not a good policy, period. And so it doesn't matter to me who lines up or who doesn't, because that's where the lobbying and the political side comes in and interferes with what public policy should be. So you can make an excuse it. If, you've, if I give you this, then you can vote for it, but that's not a legit reason to violate the public policy, which comes down to do you take public taxpayer dollars and give it to a private person that's a billionaire, period. And well, is, okay. Oh, I, I was going to say that's, that's exactly right. Um, I think UC Berkeley once described it as socializing the cost but privatizing the profits. Ah, You're, you've got a private entity that is benefiting from public tax dollars that doesn't really seem like that's going to be in the interest of the public good, so to speak. Okay, but then I would throw out the Raiders argument, the Raiders stadium, and look how much money it has brought and good it's done for the community. But your response would be, well, Michael? Well, the Allegiant Stadium success, for example, is a good argument not to subsidize stadiums. Correct. Because that says that there would have been plenty of private investments that could have made significantly more money. And keep in mind, taxpayers don't get a share of the revenue. You know, we go ahead and we put up the bonds, we do all that, the, the actual economic development that happens are, again, private interests making money there, which they should be the ones to invest in it if they want to continue to do that. Now, Sandra, would you vote yes for this because of the amendments that were made to it? Which amendments specifically? The I mean, community I, agreement. Yes. Okay. Um, 
And, and I'm, I'm a political realist, so I think I agree with anything you're saying, <laughs> but I also know how our legislature works, and so why bang your head against the wall? It's going to pass. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I did, I did appreciate that the legislators you know, went through the sausage-making process and demanded things. They didn't say, okay, we're just going to roll over. But if it's going to happen, then I'm going to expect a diverse workforce. I'm going to expect investment into homelessness. And so to me, they did put up a really good fight and say, we know where this is going because the powers that be are going to have this get passed. We're going to want to make sure that people get something. There but was, there's no penalty. I'm sorry. There's no implementation. You have a director who can come and come to the, the st stadium board and say, we think we violated it, but there's no penalty. It's a may language, not a shall language. And in the long run, I think I go back to what you're saying. Raider Stadium would have been built without our subsidy. And you have to attribute to the fact that it's a, it's a premier event center, not just for football. So they knew that they were going to bring in other shows that were there that make it. That's Vegas, baby. So no matter what. So why do you need the taxpayer to have to subsidize a billionaire with one of the worst playing teams in the United States? Sorry. Sandra, one of your arguments was you thought maybe Steve Hill of the LVCVA should have focused more on what other events outside of baseball could be brought. Right. Um, so if you if you listen to the economic forum meetings, and those are the commissioners that look at our tax revenue, and and if you listen to what's what was being said about Allegiant since it got built, it's profitable because of people like Taylor Swift and BTS and all the other events that are there. They don't really even talk about the football games, and so I think Steve Hill he had one slide where he kind of listed out medium sized events that could go into that stadium, but then they just moved on to mm -hmm. something else. Well, show me that it pencils out with that. And I think more people would have been willing to say, well, that's what Allegiant Stadium is doing, so I can see that it would be profitable. But I'll tell you, we just won the Stanley Cup, and Mr. Foley was quoted as saying, I did this on my own without a government subsidy. Well, and he, he opposed, the, the at that time, the Raiders' subsidy. And that, and that is such a good place. example, too, of how you don't need to rely on public subsidies in order to build something like this. T-Mobile Arena came up. We have mm -hmm. the Vegas Golden Knights. Within six years, they win the Stanley Cup. We've got a world-class hockey franchise here. That all happened without going hat in hand to taxpayers. Um, I think that, you know, you, you're absolutely right. This probably was going to happen no matter what. Um, and I will say that it's not as egregious as we all thought it was going to be when we first heard half a billion dollars and everything else. It certainly has been negotiated down. But, um, but it's still nonetheless, in principle, should be insulting to a lot of taxpayers who look around and say, hey, you know what? $180 million we're giving a transferable tax credits could be spent much better in education or homelessness uh, uh, mitigation efforts or whatever you want to say. Mental health programs exactly. that you vetoed for exactly. the kids. There are a lot of other so ways you couldn't you fund mental health programs or capping um, senior citizens' um, rent basis. You vetoed those saying there wasn't enough money or it was the policy, but you can go ahead and give money away on that. So we pick and choose. It's cherry picking. It really, truly is. They, they did. A, they amended both in the Senate and the Assembly. I appreciate that they listened and they tried to come up with, you know, that takes a lot of strength. And I understand that part. But if it's bad public policy, you don't negotiate against yourself. You say, thank you very much. No. Is go state, build it. They will come. Is the state putting itself at risk, in your opinion, yes, with this Yes, they're co-signers. This one's different than Ra Raiders. They're basically a co-signer. And then they, again, mandated what the county has to do with the county not even having voted on it. You will take these these bonds that maybe you're allocating for road repair or for to build transitional housing or senior house, whatever it might have been used for. Now that money is taken off the block. And then they don't pay property tax for 30 years. That's police, school, and fire. Sandra, you keep nodding your head. <laughs> <laughs> She's a realist. No, no, I, I agree with what they're saying. But at the end of the day, the way we run our elections means you have to fund your campaign. And so you're going to have to go to the unions. You're going to have to go to the casinos. You're going to have to ask for those donations to be able to run in the way we run our election processes. And so you can look at all the public policies, and then you can look at the people who are going to write those checks for you sitting at that table saying you should vote for this, and then that's what you're going to and do. And therefore, as a, as a former legislator, that's when you tell them no. Well, and I think that's part of the reason why I, I don't, I haven't seen all the polling on the issue, but I get the sense that a lot of Nevadans are opposed to this. I mean, the testimony was 85, 87% mm -hmm. opposed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's exactly part of the reason why. We know exactly what this is. This is a bunch of lawmakers talking to a bunch of lobbyists trying to figure out, hey, what can I give you and what can you give me so that way we can move this forward? And that's all happening behind closed doors. 
And that is a disturbing part of the process, it's even a, beyond yeah, the beyond handout the to private mm -hmm. as, a, as a former legislator, you have to be able to vote your conscience regardless. No, no lobbyist makes me vote, period. And any legislator says that is full of crap, okay, and they should be kicked out. You made a decision, and you blame someone else for the decision that you made. But as an elected, you made that decision, and that was your choice. And if you don't believe it's the right thing to do, then you should say no which is harder than saying yes more often than not. And so I don't buy that. I, I watched the hearings as best as I could. I think the Senate, Senator Neal brought up some excellent points, uh, Senator Scheibel. I think that there was a lot of good interaction of trying to get people back to learning how to govern. Governing is different than voting. Governing is making sure that you know what your policy ranges are. Who are you benefiting? Where are you, where's your, not only your dollars, but where's that public input coming from? And if you can't vote your conscience, then you shouldn't be there. But that's a lot to ask for people who are in a part-time legislature. That that's an excuse as well, Sandra. Days. It's not about part-time. It's oh. about whether or not you are elected to do your duty, and your duty is a public servant. And public servant means you serve the public. Not, not to pick on all politicians, but it's also just a big ask for politicians because you look at what's going on on the national stage, you have mm -hmm. exactly the same incentives. Uh, the incentives of the political process being different than the, the governing process. Right. Yeah. You know, the incentives, yeah, they, they encourage folks to... If they are Can given you clarify the difference between the political process and the governing process? So the governing process is exactly what we were talking about, the policy here. You know, the, the idea of, okay, do we want to give $180 million in transferable tax credits? Is that good policy? The political aspect of it is, all right, if I do that, who's going to support me? Okay. Um, you know, it, I need to work with the governor. Okay, if I support this for the governor, then he's going to support me on this uh, issue of mine. And that is... I think what frustrates a lot of people who just casually pay attention to this is the politics tend to overwhelm the policy issues or the government issues. Mm -hmm. I want to move on. Okay. Let's talk about <laughs> Governor Lombardo campaigning on being the next education governor. He certainly got uh, historic education funding mm -hmm. through K through 12 education funding. Uh, according to his office, per pupil funding will be up by $2,500 next year. Uh, however, his priorities in addition to funding were school choice and also school safety. How well did he succeed in those areas? Let's start with school choice, which uh, as he has said, quote, traditional public schools are not and should not be the only option. So then what are the other options and how did he go about getting funding for them, Michael. Yeah, I mean, part of the driving idea behind school choice and the reason why it's been a reoccurring issue uh, in the legislature for you know, half a decade or more now is this idea that if you've got money, you do have school choice. You can go move to a different part of town. You can uh, take some of your money and spend it on private tuition. If you are of limited means, you don't have that same choice. You don't have the financial means to send your child to a private school. You don't have the financial means to move across town. So it's a reoccurring issue that comes up every single year. Obviously, the governor was not really set up for success simply because of the political realities of the current legislature, but he certainly did push it and he at least made it a conversation. Okay. Your take on it? As a Chris? public school teacher of 30 years and one who, go again, I went to Catholic grade school as a kid. Um, that was my parents' choice. We paid for it. We didn't go to government and say, give me money. Public schools are what made America great, in my opinion. And it's the opportunity for someone to learn, no matter what your background is, where you come from, what your family's status is. You can have choice by zoning and get rid of this debate of whether or not I take public tax dollars and give it to private or, or religious schools. That's not that's undermining the public institution and of school system, period. And so if you really want to get to school choice, in my opinion, you can do it through your whole zoning component where parents then have the opportunity to say, I like this program over here. I'd like to go over to K.O. Knudsen or, or you know, whatever. That aside, the governor, I will applaud him. It, they had flush money this time. I never got to serve under flush money in my 16 years, but <laughs> they did have it. And, and, and I commend him for putting a good portion of it into K-12. We have to say that. And I commend the legislature for drawing the line in the sand and said we're not funding the opportunity scholarships, which is another way to say private dollars, okay? That said, 
the debate that happened more on the school safety was an interesting piece to me because... Let me get Sandra's take okay. first on, right. on the sure. school choice and what was taken away from the governor's omnibus education bill. Uh, as you mentioned, opportunity scholarships, funding is going to remain as is despite him wanting to significantly increase Right, and that I think that's where people are, are misunderstanding what happened. The opportunity scholarships go back to the 2015 legislative session. They had a voucher program where school dollars came out of the distributive account for education and went with the student. And the Nevada Supreme Court said you can't do that because you can't take education dollars and fund um, religious schools. But the opportunity scholarships where a business can contribute and then deduct that from their taxes, they're saying that's not the same. That is constitutional. And so that's been funded since then. It is still there. It is still funded. He wanted to go from $50 million to $500 million. That came off the table. Yeah. Well, currently we're only at about $6 million or something. So it was going to be a substantial increase Huge anyway. Increase. To put that into perspective, though, we're talking about a few thousand kids. Um, and these are, again, as it's currently set up, it's only low-income kids. So businesses will make a donation to a private scholarship organization that then has to give it to a low-income child. And... That is a program, you know, I totally understand the argument that we need to fund public schools, and I think that was the $2 billion extra dollars that Governor Lombardo put forward. The other part of it is we give financial assistance to folks all the time for very necessary services that government could otherwise potentially do. Why should education be any different, especially if it's an incentive program to fund scholarship organizations that will help low-income kids? And I was disappointed that we didn't have enough of a discussion about that in the legislature. It was very much... The legislative leadership said, this looks like school choice. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, what Governor Lombardo did get uh, in that omnibus bill left in place the potential for city and county sponsored charter schools, reinstated the Read by Three program, uh, included $140 million in funding for early childhood literacy, some potential funding for charter school transportation. I mean, overall, Sandra, how would you describe how successful he was in school choice? He got something. Choice? I mean, he needs to be able to tell his constituents he fought for something. But Nevada is a ballot initiative state. And during his State of the State address, he even said, here's my priorities. If the legislature would like to work with me, fine. If not, then let the people decide. And so there's a possibility that these things that came out of those bills, he probably said it's not worth it fighting over. Maybe there's a legislator or a, a citizen that wanted to run it as a ballot question. Okay, school safety. He did get two bills passed which reform restorative justice practices, uh, better enabling schools to suspend and expel students who commit violent acts as a former teacher yourself. I wrote the original habitual discipline law, <laughs> which is part of what they were amending this time around. And I was very careful as a former special ed teacher Age is a consideration, and I hated even doing the age 11. Now they can go down to six. Where is your programming? Where is your placement? What are you going to do with those kids? I understand it. You much. mean they can now expel students as yes. young as six years old? Yes. They removed hearing processes. It wasn't that big a modification, but if you don't have a program for those kids to go in, then you're, cr you're creating a future problem that's going to happen. What are those parents going to do? Where are they going to? We don't have enough mental health programs. We don't have enough for behavioral. Yeah. As a former special ed teacher, I focused on children with emotional disturbance. And so, yeah, they were physical. You have to look at your dis disabled community. I think the school districts have neglected special ed. Now, there's more money in there this time around. They did complete disservice during COVID shutdown to many of these young people across the state. So... The, hopefully the money that was put in there can come into some actual programming where you have counseling, you have psychologists, you have psychiatrists, you, ha you have teach parents about 504 plans, you teach teachers about 504. Half the faculty don't know how to handle and implement a behavioral plan for a special ed kid in their classroom. And that's right. where we need to really take a step back and say, what are we not doing that we have the ability to do that doesn't really cost money? In your teacher training programs and your administrative training programs and your support personnel programs come together as a faculty and, and okay these 10 kids have a behavior plan how, how are we supposed to implement it if it's not implementable the IEP can be reconvened and you can work out something that's better for the family as well as the children and still maintain safety on that campus Michael your response to uh, reforming restorative justice practices well I mean I think especially following COVID we had a lot of 
<laughs> violent cases that were highly publicized. And that's going to put a lot of parents on edge. A lot of parents are going to say, well, wait a minute, something has to change. And I think that's probably the reason why he was able to get this through, because it, it went even beyond the specifics mm -hmm. of the bill, just the mentality, this overall feeling in the state that, is my kid safe at right. school? Right. That's, a, that's a scary feeling for parents. And right. I think a lot of Democrats and Republicans understood that feeling and said, OK, we have to take some sort of step forward. This is the step that's put in front of us. Sandra? So this is why the bill that I was laser focused the whole time was AB 37, which creates the Behavioral Health Workforce Center in the Nevada System of Higher Education. Because we have known for many, many years, we just don't have enough providers. There's not counselors, social workers, school psychologists. And that's one of the reasons you can't implement a restorative justice plan because yeah. all of those paraprofessionals have to be in the school supporting the teachers. Mm -hmm. And so instead, the teachers just, just got told, well, you figure out what to do. We don't have any services. Exactly. Mm -hmm. UNLV got rid of social workers uh, even as a programming about 25 years ago. So they weren't producing anybody. Then they went, oops, we need social workers. And they re-implemented the programming. And that was only about 10 years ago, I think, right. that they so now we've got it. $2 million, AB 37 passed with $2 million, to make sure that it, that it can't go away, that it's something that's a program. Mm -hmm. And it will be at UNLV, but then it's going to reach out to the community colleges, to the rural areas. And, and to be able to say in the rural areas, you know, if you want to stay where your mom and dad are, you can do distance learning and you can become a school psychologist. We have so much more we could talk about, but we've run out of time. Really? Thank you. We have. Yeah, that went fast, that huh? Went very fast. Right. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to have you back because there's a lot more. Okay. We can go into yeah. the session once it finally does officially wrap. And I'm getting the cue to wrap. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for any of the resources mentioned on this show, go to our website, VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week. And lastly, a big congratulations to the Vegas Golden Knights on their Stanley Cup win. I'll see you next week on Nevada Week.